things today. First of all, we're going to we're going to review a um, couple aspects of inheritance that we kind of got towards the tail end of the class that I'm not 100% confident that we went through them enough. So we'll come back and we'll revisit those. One of those is constructive chaining. And I have pretty good resource, I think, on constructor chaining. It talks about the rules for constructor chaining. All right. So review that in addition to my explanation today. I have uh, a post about class diagrams. Class diagrams are a way that you can sort of plan out an object-oriented system. And a class diagram is in a way sort of like an entity relationship diagram where you uh, say what classes you're gonna use and how they relate to each other and how they use each other and if there's inheritance or whatever. So take a minute to review this UML class diagram. Here's an example. In this example, a customer can have many orders. Each order is for one customer. An order has two subclasses, a special order and a normal order. All right. So that's what this designates. It shows what the attributes are and what the methods are for that. So take a look at that. Uh, I am not entirely sure if we're going to have, if we're going to do much of these uh, in class, but it's something good to know. Um, there might be, there might be an assignment where I ask you to sort of come up with a class diagram before you code. Uh, I, I can't remember if I had one in the past or I'm not sure if we'll have one in the future, but just be aware of that. The other thing, which um, which I uh, mentioned, uh, or that, that, that's uh, going to be important for the next few labs coming up, is Java uh, dates in Java. And I have a couple of resources about that. I have um, Java 8 dates, and then I have a little class I made fun with dates that shows you how to create a date, how to create a date for a certain date, how to tell how many days are between this date and that date. So by all means, take a look at that uh, resource. Um, the last thing I wanna cover is test cases. Uh, I'm gonna start becoming a little more of a stickler on, on test cases because that's something that a lot of developers don't do very well. Uh, and I'm not just talking about people in this class, I'm talking about software developers in general. If you have an application, it's difficult to thoroughly test it because there's so many things that could happen. All right. Take the tuition example, the one that we, we did how many, uh, how many times. How many test cases do you think we should have for that? How many test students should we create for that? Nine? Nine's a pretty good number because that would be one student. Uh, it, would, it would be one student in the one to 12 category, one student in the 13 through 9, 18 category, and one student in the 19 and above category. And then you have the three residency statuses. So that's a pretty good number. You might say that you want actually 12. And the reason I say 12 is you might want to test the borderline between the cases. In other words, test right at 12 right at 13, right at 19, and one at 18. Yes. Okay. Right. I don't, I don't know if we would literally have to double them, but we probably should include test cases for those. One where we use a constructor to set values, one where we use the methods to set values, one we use one constructor, one we use another constructor. All right. Those are all good points. I mean, this can get very difficult uh, if you are going to literally contain all of those. Now, when I say I'm going to be a stickler, I'm not going to necessarily say, well, you know, look for some really odd circumstance, say you didn't test that. 
But know if you did a, 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 an assignment like that and you only tested two students, you couldn't possibly know your program work. You know your program work for those two students, but any other student is not going to work. What's the old, old uh, kind of joke that even a broken clock is right twice a day? All right. You may just coincidentally ha uh, have hit the conditions that your program works on and you think that it works. Whereas if you did some more thorough testing, um, you, would, you would tell uh, that, you know, where their issues are. A really good example of that is that extra 19 through 21 credit hours or 19 through 22. A lot of students on their first pass didn't take that into account, all right? They, uh, they had it like, it's credit hours for one through 12, 13 credit hours if it is uh, 12 or 13 through 18, and credit hours times rate if it's 19 and above. Well, it's not credit hours times rate. It's credit hours minus five times rate. So you really have to test things thoroughly to make sure they work. Here's a nice thing on test cases and how you can document them. This is a real nice diagram that, you know, again, uh, I may require this at some point that you do uh, in this format where you describe what you're going to test. Uh, you say what you expect, and then you say what actually happened. For example, I could put in, I'm going to test a student in the 1 to 12 credit hour range that's in county. And what's the test step? I'm going to use the, use the null constructor to create, or use such and such constructor to create a student, assign them four courses at three credit hours each, and then run it. Their tuition should be, who knows what that would be, $560 or whatever. All right. That's what you expected. When you run it, look on the screen. Was there $560? If so, you got a check mark. If not, you, uh, you, you need to retest. There's actually something called uh, white box testing, which is sort of a misnomer because really uh, with white box testing, it doesn't mean that the box that you're testing is white. It means that the box is transparent. What that means is with white box testing, you know what the code does, so you know what to test, all right? The opposite of that is black box testing. Black box testing, you assume you know nothing about the code inside, and you generate test cases based on that, all right? Whereas in white box testing, I know that 13 through 18 credit hours uh, is, is processed a certain way, so I, I specifically test that. All right, you can write loops to generate these things if you want to and create students or create an array of students and, and loop through them if you want to really be comprehensive. All right, so let's do a better job. I'm not talking about any individual specifically, and a number of you have been doing a good job, but especially those students that I've said you need to test this more, uh, definitely test it more. And if I didn't say that, take a look and keep these thoughts in mind and see if there's a way that you could test more. All righty. I think that's all we can get into the inheritance example now. I don't remember what this example is. Let me download it. I would disagree with that. The question was, is testing incremental? Uh, in other words, if you tested condition A, B, and C, then you make an enhancement, and then you test, you test A, B, C, D, and E again, or do you just test D and E? I would argue you test all of them again. The reason is there are things called like a regression in software. In other words, you break something that's already there, all right? You may, for example, try to include uh, a delivery order in your uh, in your uh, software, and that might screw up the way a regular order works, right? And again, the, the most famous quote I've heard from software developers 
And it almost seems like at every level, so it's not, I'm not picking on students, I'm talking about people that are in the field, is it worked on my machine, all right? In other words, they have a website and they did something and for their machine it works, but when you try to put it in production, it doesn't work. And they're always mystified why that is. Well, there could be a million different reasons for it, all right? The point is, is thorough testing should prevent something like that from happening. Ideally, anyhow. All right. I have a couple simple examples here. We're going to go through. And we're going to talk about two things. In this in these examples, we're going to talk about. Constructor chaining and polymorphism. Before we talk about constructor chaining, let me write down the rules of constructors and inheritance. Every class needs one constructor, at least. If you don't code a constructor, a no argument constructor is generated. So if you think of the very first couple assignments you did, you said student S equals new student. Well, you didn't write a constructor, all right, yet it worked. Why did it work? Well, because you didn't code any constructors, and therefore the no argument constructor was generated. And strictly speaking, all that no argument constructor does is it creates out in a location in memory called the heap, a new instance of the object and we'll assign it to a reference variable. So if I say this, this part creates a reference variable named F that can take a student object. All right, it can take any kind of student object, or rather, it can take a pointer to any kind of student object. This part of it actually creates the the, the memory, not only create the memory, but it assigns the memory in the heap and creates a student object in a certain memory location. And that pointer, that memory location gets passed in and gets stored in the variable. All right. So I hope I hope that is is clear. Any questions on that part? Now, here's where inheritance comes in. Every construct every. Super class. All the way up the chain must execute a constructor. So if you remember the example last week, if I created a delivery order, a constructor in order has to run, all right? So every superclass up the chain. In our case, we just had the two, right? We just had the delivery order and order. Actually, above that, we have object, but we're not going to worry about object. So the orders constructor runs. Now, it's going to run one of two ways. If we don't specify 
what constructor to run using super, then it will try to run the default no argument constructor. The other choice is you specify using which constructor you want to run. Okay, those are the rules. Keep these in your mind as we're going through these examples because this can get a little confusing. So let's look at the pet example. I'm probably going to play around with the test class and, and create some scenarios, but we have a pet class. Or we have a website. Okay, we have a pet class. And we have a dog class. And we have a unit test class. All right. So let's look how this works. Dog inherits from pet. That means everything that's in the dog class or everything that's in the pet class is in the dog class. Now, pet is a special kind of super class. It is a abstract class. All right. What does an abstract class mean? That you cannot create an instance of this class. So I cannot say equals new pet. All right. I can't say that because if you think about it, if you ask like someone, you know, do you have any pets? They'll say, yeah, I have a dog. Yes, I have a cat. Yes, I have a fish. Could you imagine if you ask somebody you have a pet and they said, yes, I have a pet. Well, what kind of pet is it? It's just a pet. <laughs> All right. It doesn't make sense. You know, that's why it's called an abstract class. In the real world, there's nothing that corresponds to that. All right. So it's called an abstract class. And we also have abstract methods, which we know every descendant has to implement. So the make sound method and the get food method has to be implemented on everything that inherits from pet. So the dog class has a make sound and get food. And as an additional one, called catch frisbees. It has a constructor that accepts a single or two arguments, the name and the weight. Those attributes are not defined in the pet class, all right, or in the dog class, they are defined in the pet class. So let's run this and we're gonna play around with the test case and we're gonna see if we can predict what's going to happen based on certain things that I do. Okay, what folder is that? Examples for 10 to.
go in the packs. And here's those classes. So I compile it. Java C, star.java, compiles cleanly. I run it. The dog says, bow wow. What do dogs eat? Table scraps, dog food, pretty much whatever they can. And finally, the dog catches a frisbee, says, yay, I love catching frisbees. Let's go for a ride. I'm not a dog owner, but that sounds pretty typical. Now, let's look at the unit test. I called the constructor to create a dog. What does that constructor do? The first thing it does is it calls the constructor in the pet class that also has two arguments, the name and the weight. That constructor is there, and therefore it sets the attributes of name and weight. So these two now have values. They're protected, so that's legal, all right? Um, yeah, they're, they're protected attributes, so they're not defined in dog, they're defined here, and the dog class can, ex can access them. I then call make a sound. And that is going to be called on the dog method. I call get food. That is the found on the dog method and finally catch frisbee. So it does all those things. All right, so far so good. Let's do this. Yes. Well, I made the argument list the same. Right. It could be different. Like, for example, if there were three things for a dog, like uh, the, uh, the, the name of the dog, the weight, and the kind of hair it had, you know, because some pets don't have hair, right? Then it would set the, the hair attribute uh, would be defined in dog. The other two attributes would def be defined in pet, and it would call the two argument constructor then. Okay, what if I do this? I'm going to get rid of this line, and I'm going to say I'm going to put this here, those statements here. Will that work? A little bit of a trick question. Okay, those attributes are, are protected, so this part of them is okay. I can assign a value, but when I go to compile it, let's make sure I've saved everything. This is where translating is going to be very useful to translate that error into some word that makes sense. Dog, line four, constructor pet and class cannot be obtained to the given types. Huh? Okay, what is going on here? We passed our constructor a string and an integer. We did not specify what constructor gets called on the pet class. And remember, it's a rule. The constructor on the, on the parent class has to get called. We didn't specify what constructor to call. Therefore, what? Therefore, it's going to call the no argument constructor. Is there a no argument constructor in pets? No, because we defined a constructor with two arguments. So therefore, it cannot find the no argument constructor. One won't be generated, and you're going to get an error. What if we did this? These, by the way, are things you would probably not do in programming. These are more like programming puzzles, you know? Uh, so like you might say, when would I ever want to do that? Well, you probably wouldn't, but this is just a good way to understand it. If I get rid of this, is this going to work? Okay, we have a vote for yes. I compile it and it does compile. 
Why does that work? That works because I didn't specify what constructor to call here. Therefore, it calls the no constructor, no argument constructor. There is no no argument constructor in PETS. What's more, there's no other constructors in PETS. Therefore, the no argument constructor gets automatically generated. So we satisfy the requirement of calling the constructor on PETS first, then we can do the thing in the uh, in in the dog constructor. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The super constructor and and sort of like almost like this is a, a hint. This isn't don't think of this as like 100% of the time, but usually you want to define what constructor gets called. Therefore, you will call a specific constructor as opposed to just leaving it to chance. All right. So uh, you're, you're probably not going to be using the no argument constructor. You're probably going to be setting some attributes in that. So, therefore, it would probably be a very rare case where you would not have a constructor in a pet class, all right, and, and, and so on. All right. So, let's get it back to where it was. There we go. We're back where we were. And let me make sure everything still runs. And it still runs. Okay. Now, let's, what's something that a dog, what's, what's something that we can associate with a dog? Let's say, let's say, kind of has, all right? Now, we're not gonna put that attribute in the pets class because not all pets have hairs, right? There's hairless cats, all right, I guess for one. There's fish, there's, there's lizards and other reptiles. So I'm gonna put a kind of hair attribute in my dog's class. And I'm going to default that attribute to short. Because I did a survey and most dogs have short hair. I don't know. All right, we're going to pretend that that's the case. So I'm going to write two constructors on dog. One that does not accept a constructor, or one that does not accept hair, and one that does accept hair. Now, I call this, all right? I could do this. Let's write an, let's, let's pick another property. Um, frequency of toenail clipping. We're going to call it toenail weeks. And we're going to default that 
to six weeks. Okay. So if we call this, we have three arguments. Now, what I'm writing here is going to work, but we're going to see if we can do better through constructor chaining. So, a weeks it makes arguments. And in this constructor, we said we're going to default toenail weeks for six weeks. And in this constructor, we're going to default hair type short and toenail weeks. To six. I'm going to real quick add a forget toenail weeks. And get, or it should be an answer. And get their type Now I'm going to change my unit test to add in get toenail weeks, get hair type. and get hair type. I hope this compiles. I hope I didn't make any typos. We'll find out though. So, let me save it. Make sure it compiles. That's amazing. And then we'll run it. What should we see? We're using the no argument constructor or I'm sorry, the two argument constructor for dog. It's gonna set the name and the weight. 
All right, what should we see for hair type and nails? Should see short, short and six. Because with the two argument constructor, we set the hair type to short, we set the toenails to six. All right, let's see if that's right. Well, six and short. All right, so we got that right. Now we can change it to call a third constructor with th or a second constructor with three arguments. And we'll say it has curly hair. Help if I could type. Now we should see what? We should see six and curly. Something wrong? Okay. Six and curly. All right, now we're going to set it to Four weeks, let's say, for this kind of dog. And four weeks in curly. Okay, everything works like we thought it should. All right. Now, what's wrong with this code? I mean, it works, so I mean, it's not really bad. But there's something that I don't like about this code. What do you think I don't like about it? Okay. No, that's not a problem. This would be assuming that we had other kind of pets too. In this case, we only have dogs, but we could have dogs and cats and lizards and so on that, that would inherit from pets. What I don't like about this code is what is the default number of weeks to uh, get your nails clipped or get your dog's nails clipped? It's six. How many places is that in? It's in two places. Right? That's not good. That's duplicate, right? What if the, the veteran, let's say this is for a veterinarian's uh, office, and the veterinarian says to our application, whoa, wait a minute, we, we should change that. You know, We should make the default four. That's two places that you have to change the code. Right? That might not seem like a big deal, but multiplied by many times in larger applications, that does become a huge deal. All right? To have the same piece of data or the same fact, if you will, in multiple places. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a chain. All right. So. In addition to having super as your first line, you can have this. And this means this object or this class's constructor. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to call the three argument constructor, and the third argument I'm going to give it is hard coded, coded to short. Why? Because that's what the default is. So I think we can see where this is going to go from here. The three argument constructor is going to call this. Arg hair. Comma. Six, because six is the default. Then finally, this is going to call the super class uh, constructor, and then it's going to go and set those two properties. In fact, 
It probably shouldn't do this. We, we're not taking the time to do set methods here, but you probably should say this dot set hair type equals arg hair. In fact, let me go and do that. Jair cut. Repeat that, please. Huh. Oh, you're right. No, we don't. Do we? No, we don't. The, the, the first dot was wrong. Set hair type. Now again, what we saw before wasn't wrong. It gave you the right answers. This way is better. Why is it better? It's better because we can isolate all the co code that does one thing in one place. Typed wrong and I spelled semicolon wrong. Now, some of this, why this is better might not be immediately apparent. All right. It is better because at some point we're going to be putting validation in this class. And we might only allow for certain values for like how long it takes to set, to cut the nails. We might say, well, you know, it's going to be a number between, you know, 2 and 16, for example. I don't know, dog might have really long nails by then, but we'll say that there's some slow growing nails dogs. All right, if I was setting the value for the, this instance variable, if I was setting it here, here, and here, if I had the statement that looked like this, that we had before, that looked something like this, equals something, all right, and if I had it up here too, and if I had it here, if I want to put that validation in to make sure that the value of the uh, the, the haircut uh, or the nail cut was let you know between two and sixteen weeks, all right, I would have to duplicate that validation here, here, and here. Three places for validation along with the fourth place in the actual set method. Again, repeated code, problem. By going through the set method, we can therefore put anything we like as far as validation goes in every place where that instance variable is set, the validation will execute. Because none of these set that variable directly. They all go through the method. All right, and therefore we can put in here any validation we want. And we only have to have it in the one place. 
Let's make sure I know what I'm talking about and we can compile this. We can. And we get the value that we expected. All right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about polymorphism. We did that last time. Remember, a dog is a pet. That's the whole basis of, of inheritance. A dog extend, extends pet. So a dog is a kind of pet. Therefore, this statement is valid. Pet S equals new dog. I can set the variable to spot, and I can set the other variable to 45. The name the spot, the, the, the age or the weight to 45. Now, we're creating a dog object out in the heap. Remember I said when you have object or class type variable equals new something, it creates that object in the heap. So it's creating a dog object in the heap, but it's referring to it with a pet variable. What does that mean? It means that only the methods defined on the pet are valid to call. So what are the values defined on the pet? These two. It's going to give me an error when I try to call the other three. They're abstract in the pet, but in the particular implementation of it, they're not abstract. So yes, they're abstract in pet, but they're not abstract in dog. And that's what really counts. So if we do this, I'm gonna get an error on those three things. All right, now, if we just do those three things, We don't want to do those three things. We're in business and it compiles. Why would we want to declare a variable as pet and put a dog into it? Any thoughts on that? We should keep keep in mind like the purpose of this. We have an array list of pets. I have a list of all of the pets that I'm going to see today as a as a veterinarian. All right. Tell me their names and tell me other attributes about them that are defined on the pet level. I could create an array list of pets and I could put dogs in there, cats in there, lizards in there, anything. And when I loop through that, I could ask that object, the pet object, anything that's valid for a pet. And it will give me the right version of that method. So if I use the get food method, the cats might be be finicky, right? And the dogs is eat table scraps, whatever. You'll get the right version of it because that's the object you created. Now, what if I really, 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 really wanted to treat this pet like a dog? I know it's a dog. I had to declare it as a pet for whatever reason, but I know this is a dog, so I want to do something with it. That involves what's called casting. And I could do something like this. Dog equals cast. Whoops. Dog D equals cast as a dog S. And what that will do is that will treat the variable dog, uh, s as a dog, and it'll put it in there. And now I could do that. D 
Did I create a new object? Nope, because there's only one new. There's only one object I created. I have two things pointing to it. One thing pointing to it knows it's a pet. The other thing pointing to it knows it's a dog. So the one that knows it's a dog, I can do dog things to. And I compile cleanly and it runs cleanly. Now, one last thought before we go. I can do this if I know it's a dog. In there. If this was a cat and I said, treat the dog, treat this pet as though it's a cat, you're going to get a runtime in it. Therefore, there actually is a, a uh, function in Java called type of. That you can look to see or you you can actually call the get uh get class method to see what uh what kind of object is stored in there so i could have an if statement that said if s get class equals dog then do these dog things otherwise if it's cat do these cat things so i can do this and it'll tell me it's a dog and then i could have an if statement that only called these functions if i knew it was a dog called other functions if i knew it was a cat and so on i did i'd have been scratching my head And it knows the class is a dog. So I can use that information. The type of is actually an operator where I could have an if statement if variable name type of dog, and it would work that way. But if you ever need to know what class it is, you can use that. Uh, let's see. Uh, find an example of this because this is something I don't use every day. Oh, here they use it. If type of the name of the thing. So we would say if type of S equals dog, then we could do our dog thing. We'd be able to put that in there and not worry about like, I'd only cast it if I knew it was a dog, if it passed that if thing, right? I would not cast it if I was unsure. So I would put this if statement, actually, I'll do this. And I apologize for going a little over. Just look at it this way. I give you more than your money's worth every lecture. At least that's what I tell myself. Type of S equals dog. Yes. This is returning the name of the actual class that was created, not the name of the pointer. Pardon me? It will return the class name as a string, right? I believe. Let's check. Oops. Okay. 
they tend to think that's, oh yeah. Okay, um, it's not liking this, so I'm interpreting the test uh, type of wrong. Um, let's see. There were three equals. Good eye. Okay, still doesn't like it. I'll tell you what, I will post this example as it is. Then I will figure out what's wrong with the if statement and post an update sometime today. We'll talk more about this next time. Because um, these are side, kind of the side issues with inheritance. Any questions? Is anyone going to lab? All right, we'll see you next week.